schedule. So we will move directly to our next speaker, who is Professor Spinrod. She's a, a, a world leader in emotion-related regulation and pro-social behavior in young children. She's uh, particularly interested in how these, uh, these behaviors um, are translated into later in life effects uh, uh, in, in the fields of uh, emotionality, uh, social emotional competence and maladjustment as well. She has written many, many papers and serves on the editorial board of various uh, uh, excellent um, um, journals. And we are very lucky to have her here with us. Please uh, welcome Professor Spinra. Are you going to connect this? Yeah, you can. Just let me know which one's yours here. Hold on, let me see. I think it was, hold on. This one? No. no. This one. This one? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let me. And then put it on the side show and we'll be good. Let's see this. I can try. All right. That's it? Just clip it on. Put this in your pocket. No pocket. That's all right. <laughs> this? Do you need okay. this? Yes, please. Okay, go. thank you very much. Okay, I'm doing a little double duty here because I have my presenter view here. So um, everybody can hear me okay and we're good? All right, terrific. Um, I want to start by saying thank you very much for having me here today. It's um, really a pleasure to be here, although, of course, I wish it were under different circumstances that we had a chance to visit. Um, I do, I'm going to be talking today, I always say Nancy and I uh, overlap quite a bit. We, I, I was just telling Jody we are sort of a two for one special. Um, get one, you get the other. We've been working together for nearly 20 years now, so you'll see some, certainly some overlap in terms of the work that we've done. Um, but I did want to start by saying, um, Oh, sorry, I already got you to that slide there. Um, we were fortunate enough to meet Avi. This is a picture. Um, well, we met him before, but he, he and Julia came to visit um, in January. And um, this is just a picture from our time together. Um, this was, he came to my house, and this was when we were working all together. We were working on this wonderful project on parental reactivity. Um, this project is such a lovely project, a uh, longitudinal project. We really are you know, happy to be keeping it moving forward. A lot of the work that I'll present today, uh, we used it as a basis for what we're choosing to do and what we chose when we were making some decisions about what to do with that grant. So, I'm happy to present some of these because it does tell us a little bit about why we made some of the decisions that we made when we were in these meetings. But I like this picture. You can't see it very well, but we were all so happy uh, working together, having a good time going over data and having so much fun together. And um, I do want to just tell a quick story of Avi because it was just a sweet thing. When you talk about pro-social behavior, we're talking about kindness and helpfulness, and there couldn't be a more kind person. We um, fell in love with him quite quickly, not the Romeo and Juliet type of love that Ron was talking about, but we did fall in love quite quickly because he's such a lovely man. And um, so it's nice to be able to talk about kind and helpful behaviors when we're talking and, and dedicating this to someone such a kind and, and a loving person. Um, just an example of something that just touched me so much. Um, he came to my house, we had a little party, uh, when he was there, and I have two children, and uh, Avi was so sweet with them. My two kids are crazy, okay? I mean, I love them to death, but they're a little, like, need lots of attention, and Avi was happy to give them this attention. He loves children, and uh, they both said, oh, we want to do a talent show for you, <laughs> so... <laughs> They bring Avi upstairs, make him sit on the floor, which he did happily, and we will perform for you. He was just so delightful and said, oh, okay. And <laughs> 
my son was playing the worst music. He pretends that it's, uh, maybe he liked it, I don't know, but uh, Avi was, was enjoying this, videotaping the kids, brought it back, so you guys had an opportunity to see my children give a talent show, uh, which I apologize ahead of time that you had to sit through that. Um, but such a lovely, lovely man, and we just enjoyed our time so much together. I wish I'd gotten to know him better just because we didn't have a lot of time with him. We started this project a few years ago and really didn't get time to come here to Tel Aviv and have more, more time together. And it was in the plan, of course, so I'm happy that I was able to be here today. Um, but again, we'll be talking uh, a lot about the study in which we used a lot of the data that we already had from that study to, to think about what we would do for this other study that we're doing together. I also want to, before I begin, sort of talk about collaborators and, and thank people that are involved in this. This is a short list of some of the people that are on many of the papers that um, I'll be talking about today. But you can see this large group of people we get to meet at SRCD. Um, this was a couple years ago, SRCD, and I wanted to include this particular one, such a large group, because Nancy and her colleagues are there, so many of us now. Um, from all over the world, but I just wanted to point out that there's Avi there in this picture, and uh, I think that was the first time I actually got to meet him, and it was just a, a lovely dinner. We all went out together, so thank my collaborators for this work as well. Now, I know Nancy sort of stole my thunder already with some of these. I, you know, as I said, two for one special we should have discussed with each other. Um, but we, um, I will go over this again um, a little bit about um, some of these conceptual issues. So I'm focusing today, before I even begin, I kind of want to go over my overview. I think I can figure out this laser. Yes. So the overview today, I'm a little different. Uh, Jody and we were talking about being divas. This is part of my diva piece is that I love to talk about my own studies. So you'll get to hear a lot about our study and our own work that we've been doing today. Um, I will be talking, do some conceptual pieces, but talking for the most part about three different studies today that I'll kind of walk you through that today. Um, but as Nancy has already mentioned, when we're thinking about empathy and pro-social behavior, researchers are really making these very important distinctions, and these distinctions are quite critical when thinking about what predicts children's pro-social behavior and empathy-related responding. So we'll start with some definitions just to get us started, which is empathy, as, as Nancy mentioned, is an affective response stemming from the apprehension or comprehension of another's emotional state or condition similar what, to what the other person is feeling or expected to feel. So as Nancy mentioned, you see a child, child is very sad, you feel sad yourself. That would be an empathy response. The sympathy response, um, very similar kind of behavior, and it might stem from empathy as well, but emotional response stemming from the apprehension of another's emotional state or condition but instead of it being the same, it involves feelings of sorrow or concern for the other. And this will be the last real overlap between my talk and, and Nancy's talk, which is the conceptual definition of personal distress. And again, in thinking about personal distress, this is much more self-focused. And I think even describing what it looks like will be helpful to see this is much more of a, um, a self-focused, almost an anxiety type of response so that when you see somebody who's distressed, a person who's experiencing personal stress, themselves feel some anxiety. It's not really like, oh, they feel sad. They actually feel sort of an anxiety, a much more personal self-focused response. And I think that's the best way to describe it as a self-focused state, discomfort or anxiety upon seeing this other person's distress. Okay, another distinction. Also in thinking about pro-social behavior, researchers often are interested in telling us whether or not this pro-social behavior is truly altruistic. So here, thinking about what are the definitions of pro-social behavior and what are definitions of altruism. Pro-social behavior is voluntary behavior intended to benefit another. This is sharing, donating, 
comforting another person. Those types of responses are pro-social behavior. Altruistic behavior are pro-social behaviors, but they're motivated by other oriented moral concerns. So when we think about altruism, it's just a, a type of pro-social behavior that's other oriented. Well, when we're working with children, it's quite difficult for us to know what exactly are the motivations um, for these pro-social behaviors. So in general, we really are thinking about pro-social behaviors because we can't always know what the motivations are. So I'll talk in a, a slide or two a little bit more about these motivations. But in general, um, what we're thinking about here is using the term pro-social behavior just because we really don't know necessarily what the motivations are and it's a broader term. So that's what I'll be talking about today. When thinking about how these empathy-related responses, um, empathy, sympathy, personal distress are related to pro-social behaviors, this is uh, theoretical work, but also as well some empirical studies that have shown us that there are differentially related to pro-social behavior. This is using uh, facial measures of sympathy as well as physiological measures of sympathy. The work has shown that sympathy, um, and of course this is sort of theoretical as well, sympathy being an other-oriented response should be associated with the desire to reduce the other person's distress. It is very other-oriented, likely leads to altruism. Again, that's theoretical. But findings have shown, and this is just a, a series of studies um, by Nancy and ourselves and colleagues have shown that indeed sympathy is positively associated with pro-social behavior in young children. Personal distress responses. These are theoretically, again, associated because they are self-focused, associated with a motivation to reduce one's own distress. So in this case, it's likely not to lead to pro-social behavior, to actually lead to avoidance, um, unless there's no way to avoid. So in some contexts, you just can't get out of the situation, so you might not be able to avoid it. But in a situation where you can avoid it, it's likely to be negatively related to pro-social behavior. And again, we have some empirical evidence here that tells us that that is indeed the case. Further, we have been thinking about some distinctions in pro-social behavior. And again, this sort of is the idea here is to get to understand what the motivations are for pro-social behavior. So when thinking about pro-social behavior, we've been trying to think about what types of pro-social behaviors might help us understand whether or not it's other-oriented or not in terms of knowing whether or not these are more altruistic types of pro-social behavior. So as I said, it's very difficult to know whether something is other-oriented or not. So some of the things that we've been looking for are whether or not the pro-social behavior is spontaneous. In other words, it occurs without someone asking you to do it. Or is it compliant? So if a peer says to you, hey, give me that toy, and you give it to them, that might be less other-oriented kind of response, or at least not as, maybe it's just less assertive type of behavior um, than something that would be more spontaneous. So we would see that spontaneous would be mother, more other-oriented than sharing when somebody asked or comforting when somebody asked you to do that. Is it costly? This would be another question that we would ask. Donating or volunteering time is considered to be much more costly, say, than if somebody just, you know, I dropped those cups there. If someone had, none of you did, but if some of you, if someone had come over and, and picked up those cups, that's not a difficult thing to do, not very costly, right? So we would think the more costly pro-social behaviors are more other-oriented. And is it anonymous? Anonymous is more likely to be performed for intrinsic reasons than if one were to be acknowledged for the pro-social acts. Okay. Okay. OK, 
Okay, so um, in the first study that I'll be talking about today, I am interested in studying the relations of child characteristics to empathy-related responding and pro-social behavior. Again, Nancy brought up some of these child characteristics in thinking about effortful control and negative emotionality. The idea being here that children who um, are highly controlled, um, who have regula regulatory skills, would be more likely to be able to not necessarily become over aroused um, when seeing another person who's distressed. Um, and a child who's dispositionally quite negative in terms of their emotionality may be um, led to this sort of over arousal personal distress responses, particularly if they don't have regulatory skills or their regulatory skills are low. So we've seen some of that in the work that Nancy discussed just a little bit ago. Here's some of the references for that. Okay. Okay, so starting with the first study, I like to bring up pictures of those who were working on the study. You got Nancy live, so you really didn't need the picture of her, but of course this is with um, Nancy. Eisenberg, and this is Jeff Liu here, who is uh, one of the collaborators on this project. And this particular study was regarding how child char characteristics of both emotionality, and in this case, we were looking uh, specifically at fearfulness and children's regulation. And now here's where things are a little different than some of the measures that Nancy already spoke about, because we're really looking at physiological regulation for these particular studies and how they predict toddlers' pro-social actions. And again, this, this study was much of the basis of some of the work that we're, we were doing with Avi. It's just the publication. Okay, so just in thinking about fearfulness. People um, who are prone to negative emotions particularly if they are intense or unregulated, are thought to experience personal distress responses rather than sympathy responses. And in particular, the notion of fearfulness is really important because this is an emotion that's thought to um, prompt self-preservation and escape. So um, individuals who are more fearful are likely to avoid distressing situations and are less likely to engage in other oriented behaviors. Further, um, another measure that we've been using to study regulation is physiological self-regulation. We've been using a measure of respiratory sinus arrhythmia, which is considered a physiological index of regulation. The idea here is that children who have higher RSA, respiratory sinus arrhythmia, are thought to be more flexible and they're thought to cope better with stress. And there's one other measure um, that we've also used, which is RSA suppression. And what that is is really a change, um, a change between a baseline and some sort of challenge. In this case, we have two different films that, child, that toddlers are watching. Um, RSA suppression represents a readiness to respond to contextual demands and coping with the environment. So one other measure that we believe to be a measure of physiological regulation, both RSA baseline as well as RSA suppression. I, um, I mentioned that I have two children. This is my third, the Toddler Emotional Development Project. <laughs> so we think of this, this project as my other baby um, and something that Nancy and I have worked quite quite long on this particular study. It is a longitudinal study of toddlers. Um, I proposed doing this to Nancy many, many years ago, and Nancy thought it was a terrific idea. Now I think she'll never study toddlers ever, ever again, <laughs> but besides this project. Um, very, very difficult work that we've been doing. Our first laboratory visit with the toddlers was at 18 months 
We continued to see the toddlers just about every year until they were no longer toddlers. They were school-aged children. We did this until they were about seven years old. Um, I'm going to be discussing today truly just a few studies um, from this toddler emotional development project. Um, and I use different time points depending on the study. So this particular study was just using the first two time points, which was the 18-month and 30-month visits. Um, for all of the slides I have of the Toddler Emotional Development Project, the composition of the sample was mostly um, white, non-Hispanic, uh, and Hispanic children. We have a relatively low risk sample for this particular study. But what you'll see is that we see them at many, many ages. In terms of what our measures were for this particular study, we did measure physiological self-regulation. So you see the picture here. Um, this is my son as a, the guinea pig for all studies. So we get to see him in many of our uh, pictures here. Uh, we had children watching a neutral film, and what this film was was just a film of pleasant babies. Um, they were not particularly positive, but they, you know, it was with some music that they were watching. This, the video was with a little bit of pleasant music. Um, nothing terribly positive. The babies were just, you know, cute babies. And so these toddlers would watch this few-minute video of, of these babies. And then they also watched a film of crying babies, so a very short snippet of crying babies. So what we could do is get our baseline RSA as well as RSA suppression, which is really a change um, from a change score that was calculated from the neutral film to the crying babies film. I want to talk just a moment about how we observed fearfulness. We, um, we do much of our studies, our multi-method longitudinal, multi-reporter longitudinal studies as, as Nancy mentioned. This was a particular um, study in which we observed fearfulness rather than um, had questionnaires for it. What we did in this particular study, um, and you're all going to hate me by the end of this because you'll think of how mean I am to children, but um, it's, this, this is a standardized task. Um, this is a task in which we have this toy spider. It's very furry. Have, I don't know if any of you are familiar with this spider. Um, it's a toy spider that has this little pump on the end of it. So what we did is we would ask the toddlers, we show the toddlers, Look what I have. I have a wonderful, adorable spider. It's so soft. It, it's soft like a bunny. Come touch it. And um, have them come closer. Come on. As soon as they would reach for it, the experimenter pushes on this pump, and the spider jumps. Of course, that, some toddlers thought that was hysterical, but some did not. <laughs> We did that three times. So three times that we pumped this, and then afterwards, after they may have fallen on the floor crying, um, we, we then show them, oh, look, it's just a toy, and show them how it works and give them the opportunity to, um, to do the pump themselves. But um, this is a standardized task um, of fear. I know, you'll all hate me by the end of this. <laughs> Um, we also measured pro-social actions, and we are doing this, this task in the um, sleep study with uh, Avi's, the BSF grant that will be doing this task. And this is, um, we have an experimenter who is very clumsy, and the experimenter drops a bunch of toys on her toe, and, um, and she complains about it for quite some time. She really goes on. And um, we are able to see if there's some empathy towards the experimenter. This is someone they don't know particularly well, but they've been working with a little bit, but basically a stranger. We uh, have, have observed during this concerned attention 
Hypothesis testing is this idea of, you know, asking the mother, mother's in the room during this time, uh, what's going on here, or sort of pointing to the mother. So uh, young children, many of them don't have much language. Personal distress reactions, we see uh, self-soothing behaviors as well as comfort seeking from the mother, because remember that the mother is in the room during this time. Pro-social behavior can be physical help or even indirect help, such as getting the mother to come help. So those are pro-social actions. And I think that, yes, the next is a video. And I want to give uh, a little uh, segue to the video. Uh, first off, you're going to see this video in a moment. And um, this video is actually from a study, not this, not the toddler study, but it's the same assessment. So I am uh, happy to show you this one. It does show uh, personal distress responses. Um, as well as pro-social behavior, as you'll see a few of those. I do want to mention ahead of time that a number of people tend to feel personal distress watching the personal distress. So um, I call that meta-personal distress, I suppose. So you can uh, see how you feel watching this particular piece. And hopefully the sound will work on here. And I'm going to try to get that to work. Try that. Let me actually get the volume up. And I have a very good actress on this one. It still really hurts. Ow, oh, Ben, the toys hurt my toe. Can you make it feel better? Ow. Oh. Ben, the toys hurt my toe. Can you make it feel better? these sort of self-focused responses um, as well as pro-social behavior, which you saw in those clips. Okay, so next for our results for this particular study. Our first question, did fearfulness predict empathy-related responding and pro-social behavior? I do want to mention that in this study, we did do panel models, and so we're able to, to test these relations by also testing stability um, in fearfulness as well as the responding. What we found, even given that, was that fearful reactions were positively related to personal distress reactions as we predicted during the feigned distress. That was true both at 18 and at 30 months. And fear also predicted low helping behaviors, and that was longitudinally predicting these helping behaviors, again, controlling for stability in the outcomes. Did physiological regulation predict em empathy-related responding? The answer to this is yes, indeed it did. Resting RSA um, was at least marginally positively related to indices of sympathy. RSA suppression predicted helping at 30 months of age. And the relation of RSA suppression to personal distress actually changed with age. Um, it was actually a positive relation at 18 months and negative at 30 months. So perhaps behaviors like comfort seeking are actually appropriate for the younger children. And so that was sort of our thinking about what might be happening there. And just in terms of the discussion for this particular study, in thinking about uh, the relations of these child characteristics, 
to empathy-related responding. Self-regulation can help to manage children's fearful or distressed reactions. Um, we believe that self-regulation might enhance other-oriented responses, and that low fearfulness predicts pro-social behavior. It does lead to some open questions, and the first of these open questions, which I'll tell you about in a moment, is the role of other emotional reactions beyond fear, and also how might we intervene, how might we promote regulation skills, which again I'll get into in a little later. But in also in thinking about um, that, that first open question is a, another study, which was what's the role of other emotional reactions? And here we examined children's sadness in relation to sympathy and pro-social behavior. And again, I want to acknowledge uh, co-authors on this paper, Allison Edwards, uh, one of our recent PhD graduates, and of course Nancy here in a study predicting sympathy from young children's sadness. Our findings here show that earlier sadness marginally positively predicted later sympathy, even after controlling um, for stability in the constructs here. So, um, so what we're finding here is it's this different emotion, sadness. Um, and this is dispositional sadness was positively related to, sim to sympathy responses. So as been found in prior work, sympathy also predicted higher pro-social behavior has been found in other work. So the next questions that we ask have to do with parenting and what can we do uh, in terms of where do parents fit in with all of these questions about pro-social behavior. Um, so, I'm sorry, the font changed here. This is probably a Mac to PC issue here, but although empathy-related responding and pro-social behavior likely stem from these individual differences in temperament of emotionality and regulation, um, the development is also likely related to socialization outcomes. So um, I want to just talk about a few areas in pro-social or in parenting that are likely related to pro-social and we've found as well as others have found that child-centered, emotionally available parenting has been positively associated with sympathy and pro-social behavior. And we've found this in a number of studies and let me tell you what I mean by parental warmth. Uh, we're looking at sort of uh, positive feelings between the mother and the child, encouragement oftentimes are in some of these studies, as well as uh, parent-child uh, free play situations that have sensitivity in there. So we're looking at parent sensitivity in some of these studies. And again, we've shown this in a couple of our studies showing that when parents are more warm or supportive in some way, and others have found this as well, that children are more likely to exhibit sympathy and pro-social behavior. Another area of parenting that has shown to predict children's pro-social behavior is inductive discipline. And thinking just about sort of the theory here, um, inductive discipline is really when we are giving explanations, we're talking about the causes and consequences of others' emotions. So really kind of having this type of control strategy that involves a lot of explanations. And um, if you provide reasoning and explanations, that's likely to predict pro-social behavior because it generates just the right amount of arousal. I'm, I'm uh, giving attention to this person's distress, but I'm not actually doing anything that might over-arouse uh, my child by having any sort of punitive types of responses to them that might be very over-arousing for children. So it maintains an optimal level of arousal, which will in turn allow children some opportunity for learning. Indeed, um, this is a long-term longitudinal study that Nancy Eisenberg and our colleagues have been doing, which actually showed that, um, that um, Mother's reports of inductive reasoning in childhood predicted adolescents' pre uh, friend-reported sympathy. That was in early adulthood, right, Nance? That was early adulthood, so quite a long-term longitudinal study showing the importance of inductive reasoning. Okay, so jumping into study two, um, I want to again 
put up Nancy's picture, but with um, our colleague Zoe Taylor, who Zoe is an assistant professor at Purdue University. She was a postdoc with us, and, um, and we very much enjoyed working with her on these issues related to pro-social development and socialization. For this particular study, I just want to tell you a little bit about the theoretical background of this particular study and what, we were, what our thinking is. So um, here we're thinking about parental socialization here and uh, the biological foundations. So again, child characteristics as well as socialization practices. Looking at both of these is quite important. But here what we're really thinking about is thinking about the role of self-regulation as a potential mediator for children's pro-social dispositions. So for this study, for study two that I'll be talking about today, what I'm looking at here is actually observed for this parental socialization. We use observed um, authoritative parenting. Our biological foundations, our RSA. We are using effortful control measures as our mediator. And our outcome for this particular study is children's sympathy. Again, the Toddler Emotional Development Project. Um, we talked about the first two time points for the prior study. For this particular study, um, we used three time points. It was the 42 months, so this is sort of taking off from where we left off on the prior study. Our 42-month assessment was our time one for this particular study. Our time two was at 54 months, and our time three was actually a combination because we had uh, these were questionnaire measures we used, so 72 and 84 months combined were our time three measures. And again, the same sample from the Toddler Emotional Development Project by this time point. We measured observed authoritative parenting. This was during two different tasks. We had a puzzle task where the, um, the parent and the it's really the mothers in this particular study. So the mother and the young child completed a Lego model. So we showed them a picture of this is what you need to complete, gave them a bunch of Legos to play with, and gave them five minutes or three minutes, I think, to actually complete this Lego task. And then a free play task where they just got to play with uh, a basket of toys with no, con no restrictions on them. We measured mother's warmth, her sensitivity, to measure authoritative control. Uh, again, we have RSA at time one. This was to the neutral and the distress films. We measured effortful control using three ratings. This was mother's reports, teacher's reports. That was using the Rothbart scale that Nancy spoke about. We also have observer's ratings. And the ratings here were after our laboratory visit. Um, we had four different observers who were at the lab visit because it took four people to do this, the camera person in the back, the graduate student who was supervising, the experimenter, um, and sort of our tech person. So we had four people um, either that watched the entire visit and at the end of the visit, they um, also filled out a short form to get a sense of persistence and attention during that. The sympathy, the time three measure, was both mothers and teachers' reports of sympathy. For the results for this study, and I'll just walk you through this particular study here, we have observed authoritative parenting, RSA suppression, baseline RSA, and sympathy at time one, which I didn't mention. We do want to control for our time one sympathy responses. So we have, of course, stability in sympathy over time. But as predicted, at least for the RSA, is that RSA predicted effortful control, um, which in turn predicted sympathy. Authoritative parenting predicted effortful control, which in turn predicted sympathy. Um, there were no direct relations between authoritative control and sympathy. So what does this tell us? There were no direct associations with parenting. Instead, the relations of RSA and parenting were mediated by this important factor that Nancy's brought up to us, effortful control, even after controlling for initial levels of sympathy. I do want to mention other types of parenting behaviors above and beyond these kind of authoritative control, and that is emotion-related socialization practices. 
When we're thinking about emotion-related socialization practices, what kinds of things do parents do that will help children learn regulation, um, help children learn how to cope and manage with their emotions, as well as hopefully learning some, uh, some regulatory strategies, as well as lowering those negative emotions. Uh, that can be occurring in three ways that we've sort of discussed in much of our work. That can be parents' reactions to children's emotions. How do parents actually respond when children exhibit some type of negative emotion? Um, it can be through their own expressions of emotions, so parents certainly are expressing and modeling different emotions, as well as parents' discussion of emotions, so the way in which parents talk about emotions with their children. Which brings us to study three, how do these types of socialization behaviors predict? I want to say, um, or I'll, I'll mention it in a little bit, but this Really? Wow. Okay, um, I'll mention it in a little bit that um, this is a hot off the press, not even off the press uh, study. I like to mention uh, studies that are not quite out there yet because I think it's fun to get feedback on them. So if you'd like to have some feedback, uh, we'd be happy to get some of it. This is examining also aspects of temperament. In this case, we're looking at shyness or inhibition. And uh, parenting quality, here we're looking at just that, what I was mentioning before, emotion-related parenting to children's pro-social behavior, as well as their personal distress responses. What we believe is that shyness or inhibition would be expected to be or, uh, related to self-oriented responses. Again, the personal distress behavior is likely because they may be over-aroused also low levels of pro-social behavior for a couple reasons, perhaps due to the over-arousal, but also pro-social behavior often requires some approach to other people. So shyness is likely to be negatively related to pro-social behavior. But few researchers have really examined emotion-related parenting practices um, to pro-social behavior. And in this case, we're looking at two different styles of emotion-related parenting practices. This would be emotion-focused, which is really if I have lost my very favorite toy and I'm crying and I feel terrible about it. Emotion focused is what can we do to comfort you to make you feel better. And problem focused is let's think of ways, where did we leave it last? Let's think of ways to solve the problem. Where might we have left it? Um, let's think of ways of um, retracing our steps to try to find it or maybe there's a substitute favorite toy that we could use today. Again, the Toddler Emotional Development Project, because this is my other baby. Um, we're looking at the 30 and 42 month data sets for this particular study using uh, mother's reports of their coping with toddler's negative emotion scale. We created a supportive uh, coping strategy using the emotion focused and problem focused subscales. Mothers and caregivers reports of shyness and inhibition. And again, observed pro-social and observed personal distress from the um, like the videotape you saw. I'm going to go over this. This is all one model, but I'm just going to go over it in pieces so you understand where we're coming from in these types of models. Um, first of all, just to kind of mention here that we have stability over time in all the variables. Supportive parenting, pro-social behavior, personal distress, and shyness inhibition are, are stable over time. Within time, there are some correlations. This is a marginal correlation between pro-social behavior and shyness inhibition, and a, and a significant correlation between supportive parenting and shyness inhibition. Uh, next, just to show you the cross-lag piece of this. The importance of this is that supportive parenting is positively predicting pro-social behavior, as you'd expect. It's also negatively predicting, although marginal, personal distress reactions and uh, shyness inhibition. And the last part of this that's kind of interesting and something we might not have expected was that personal distress reaction actually predicted more shyness inhibition a year later, even after controlling for stability in the model, uh, stability in the construct. So the recap for this particular um, paper is that shyness is negatively related to pro-social behavior, positively related to personal distress, um, and distress at 30 months predicted shyness a year later, and parenting predicted pro-social behaviors in the expected ways. Open questions. 
Um, actually, I didn't mention in this that we did obviously test bi-directional relations. How is parenting or predicted by some of the other variables? It didn't, we didn't show that in this particular study. It's still possible that bi-directional relations might be found between quality of parenting and children's um, empathy-related responding. So I just like to put this little idea up of who is it that's leading who, right? We could have the child leading the parent or the parent leading the child. So I think that's kind of a nice way of thinking about a parent effects model and a child effects model. Very important to be checking these bi-directional effects. Um, this is kind of my favorite part of the talk of talking a little bit more about future directions and something that we're really interested in doing. I'm really jazzed about this um, because this is an area that I'm very interested in understanding. What are the boundaries in children's, in terms of the recipients of pro-social behavior? So this is kind of the next step of where our work is going. Um, this is just thinking about the recipients. And, um, and we sort of thought about this, this idea of what does it mean to be pro-social to people with whom you have a relationship with. So having pro-social behavior towards your mother or towards your friends versus someone who's basically a stranger that we've seen in most of these studies that I've been showing you. The experimenter is pretty much a stranger. What about people who are in your in-group? versus people who are uh, in an out group or perhaps stigmatized groups. What does that mean in terms of uh, how do we understand the development of this? And this is an area that we're focusing on right now for our current work. And as I said, I'm really, really excited about it because it's an area in which I actually, uh, in a paper that was from 2006, studied a little bit of this, but just barely. We studied 18-month-olds. Uh, and in this study, we had three different recipients of pro-social behavior. This is work I did with Cindy Stifter. This was, we had a mother pretend to hurt herself, the experimenter pretend to hurt herself, and a crying baby doll. And the baby was wrapped up in a blanket and very realistic looking, but also realistic sounding. It had a very, very excellent tape of baby crying and we came in with the wrapped up baby and, um, and also examined 18 month olds uh, responses to that. What I want to point out on this, and this is again 18 month olds, very old study, but uh, one of the things I think is very interesting here is that what you'll see is that concerned awareness, which we think of as being sympathy, with, was positively correlated across all three of these conditions. Uh, personal distress, similarly. If a baby, if a toddler was, was distressed at one of these, they seem to be distressed at all of them. But what I think is also particularly interesting here, and this is what I really want to highlight, is that that's not true for pro-social behavior. That actually for pro-social behavior, the only two that were correlated was the baby doll and the mother. Now I think what's happening here, these are the mother, you know, in terms of mean levels, the toddlers were most pro-social towards mothers as opposed to others. They were also pretty darn pro-social towards that baby doll because who could resist a crying baby, right? So if you were pro-social to the mother, you're pro-social to the baby, but not necessarily to the stranger, someone who's unrelated to you. Um, so less motivation. And we're very interested in seeing what this means um, for older children. We're going to be studying kindergarten through second graders. And I just want to talk very briefly about this project that we've just finished a data collection on a pilot study. So it's not even a real study yet, but it's, it, was, it felt like a real study. Another one of my babies, uh, Project KID, we called this Kindness and Development Project, really interested in examining these age changes in sympathy and pro-social behaviors towards various pro-social recipients. And in this case for the study, we're going to be looking at in-group versus out-group, or actually just uh, we're doing this based on race. And I'll show you this in just one moment, what we mean by this. I had 102 kindergarten through second graders that just have been through our laboratory assessment. We have another 100 participants who will be participating um, in Pennsylvania with Debbie Label, who's also our collaborator on this. She's at Lehigh University. 
Um, and we're currently truly just collected these 102, finished in May, and uh, Debbie's just collecting now. We are just getting these data together, so I have nothing to report to you beyond I think it's a really cool study, and I hope you'll give me some feedback on it. We are interested in all of these participants are Caucasian, white Caucasian. And we're very interested to see if children will exhibit differences in pro-social behavior towards Caucasian victims versus those who are African American. And I'm just going to super briefly, because I'm just about out of time here, I want to show you a little bit of what we did. We're showing films to these um, young children. And um, the films I had to hire actors, we had auditions, we had children came in. I didn't know I was going so Hollywood, but I love it. Um, we had auditions for children to be actors in these videos, and I just, and I just want to, if there are a way to turn that down, I guess I'm, I have always been very loud. I'm super loud, I apologize. Okay, I'll bring that down. Um, anyways, I'm almost done. So um, this is just an example of some of the videotapes. We created, every videotape was created four times, four different ways, and this is just one example. There are two videos here. Uh, one is you're not invited versus you're not my friend. And these are very similar scripts, and, and boys will see boys, girls will see girls. And here's one example of this terrible boy up top. He's my son. Um, he, um, I had to hire him. I didn't have enough boy actors. Um, he says, oh, guess what, to this one peer, guess what, I'm having this fabulous birthday party, uh, I have an invitation for you, and then there's another child sitting right there, oh, you're not invited, why not? Because you're not my friend. And, um, and then there's another one where there's another party they're invited to, a backyard movie night, and you're not invited. So very similar to studies. And they get both, so they'll see one uh, in which the victim is African American, and one in which the victim is Caucasian. Again, the girls will see the girls, the boys will see the boys. So we're very interested to see how the children respond, and then we give them an opportunity to help. Um, not helping these children per se, but we ask them how we are obviously observing the children's faces. We'll see sympathy responses. We'll see personal distress responses to these. Um, but we also give them opportunities to help and share with other children. Um, and again, just differing the recipients. So we're really excited about the study. I'm super jazzed about it. So hopefully we'll find some things, our hopes for this study, just understanding this extensivity towards broader groups rather than just friends and families or in-group. We're also going to be studying uh, parents, parents' attitudes towards others, parenting behaviors, uh, parents' own sympathy. We have many of those measures, children's attitudes. Eventually, we hope that it turns into a longitudinal desi design and that we could extend it to other outgroups as well. So that's really our future work, what we're looking to doing. And I just want to again thank you so much for having me and dedicate to Avi. <laughs>